Awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys having me here in Belfast. This is such a lovely city, and I always uh, make the mistake of never spending um, a enough time at, at a given place, especially when I travel, travel internationally. But my name is Tony Ucita Velez. I go by Tony UV just simply because it's a lot simpler on the palette. Um, and I, I basically come from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm the author of uh, one of the two authors of PASTA, the Process for Attack Stimulation and Threat Analysis. And we're going to dive in today to some case studies. I um, apologize, I don't, didn't conform until the last minute to the uh, OWASP live deck, but I did strip out all the vendor references and stuff like that. Um, this, this focus today is strictly going to be on case studies on threat modeling. So we're going to touch upon different applications for a risk-centric approach for how to apply PASTA. Um, like I said before, uh, my name is Tony Ucita Velez, go by Tony UV. I wrote this book about five, six years ago with Marco Morana, another OWASP uh, leader. I run the Atlanta chapter in the United States, and, um, and Marco's been affiliated with OWASP and several different projects as well. Um, I run a security firm called Versprite based out of Atlanta. It's a global security consulting firm. And a lot of the stories and war stories I'll be sharing with you today from an application security threat modeling standpoint will really hail from just working across multiple, multiple different multinational companies from across the world. Uh, we've done, done work in Sweden, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, UK, United States, Canada, Latin America, and different industries from retail, higher education, finance, banking, and uh, healthcare. So hopefully there's a little bit of everything here for the, the broad range of audience members that are here today. <clears throat> Let's start, you know, obviously we gotta dive in with some level setting basics. And the reason I bring this slide up is because I mean, recently, you know, <clears throat> due to some projects and talking to a lot of uh, uh, peers and uh, seeing how threat modeling is basically being uh, gravitated towards uh, by different industry, different companies, you know, I always like to go back to the basics. What does the word say? Threat model, right? You want to model your threats. That's the whole point. And when you're doing application threat modeling, um, you want to be able to create a model for your applications, right, of, of, of different types of threats. And you want to substantiate that. You want to put away the FUD, you want to actually have evidence, evidence-based model so that you can defend and architect and design and code good applications that are resilient. So the reason I bring this up right now is because, and I want to emphasize on the word threat, because there was kind of a pseudo debate on the OWASP Slack channel about, you know, is there really an importance of threat uh, to a developer, to uh, someone that is writing an application? If you look at where we are today with application security and all the different plethora of tools that we have, SAS and DAS and pen testing, all of those types of important processes that are actually integrated into PASTA, and we'll talk about that in a second, you, 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 have, um, you don't have a good notion of, of threats. You're attacking something, but you're not really substantiating the threat motive, the, uh, the actual threat actor. And so one of the benefits of, of threat modeling is to be able to provide context. It's contextual-based uh, model for threats for your applications, and I think it's extremely useful. Um, in, in my experience in working with different developer, development groups, um, one of the things that you, you go back, let's say, 10 years, the developers are given like you know, SAS reports and static analysis reports and uh, dynamic analysis reports, and they're having to figure out what does all this stuff mean? What is the, what is the likelihood? Those are answers that, within those types of processes, traditionally they couldn't answer. So along comes, you know, PASTA. Marco and I worked on PASTA to basically introduce some level of evidence-based attack modeling, threat modeling for applications. It's a very risk-centric approach. It's really focused on evidence, and really the two main distinguishing uh, capabilities are really around understanding, you know, the impact of your application use cases and related components to the importance of the application. The other thing, too, is that you want to substantiate threats and feed the model with threats so that you're not just you know, doing FUD to your audience members, uh, your application development teams, your product owners, your information owners that are your information that's being managed by these applications. So it's very much a um, harvesting threat intel from the outside looking at threat data, which might come from your application logs or platform logs or container logs, whatever you're logging in order to substantiate some level of traffic that might be nefarious and affecting your applications. The hardest thing really with threat modeling has been um, the predictive, the probabilistic analysis of threats. That's always hard when you're trying to do you know, statistical analysis on 
how, how can you say that you know, we are more predisposed for this type of attack versus another? And that's, that's the hardest thing to, you know, to really achieve. Um, I, we, I can talk about that when we cover you know, things stage, stage by stage here in this presentation, but uh, and I'll have some ideas uh, for, for answering that. But it largely you know, begins with harvesting the, the data that you have and having really good threat intel. Now, as most of you know, there's a lot of trash for threat intel that's out there. It's a lot of noise. It's a lot of things that you can't really streamline into intelligence for a threat model. So it's, it's, you really have to cherry pick good threat intel to feed a, into an appropriate model. Um, the two kind of, this is just a taxonomy of terms listing. I mean, many of you here may have already heard of these terms in this type of vernacular. The main things I wanted to focus on here are really the threat and the attack. You know, a threat, um, I wanted to distinguish those two terms because, you know, oftentimes they're used interchangeably. You know, you look at the Microsoft tool that exists today, it's a great tool. It's been around for a while, it's free. Um, it basically has a, uh, you know, very light threat library of bad things that could happen. But it's really an, an, an attack library. You know, you look at some of the other um, things like uh, KPEC from MITRE. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty nice, good listing and well thought out, integrated mapping to weaknesses, but it's, uh, it's an attack library. And so I, I, we work a lot with MITRE and the, the, the individuals and teams that have developed the CVEs and the CWEs and the KPECs. And there's a recognition that there isn't the proper mapping you know, there, there, there's really a threat library that's missing. You'll hear me plug the OWASP Security Summit that's coming up in about a month in London because we're trying to solve this problem. We're trying to come up with a threat library. And then in this presentation, I actually take a, um, introduce a, a kind of a, a proposal for a threat library that you might be able to, to uh, embrace within your own application threat modeling routines. <clears throat> this part of the presentation, I'm really kind of to, to to, to cover the basics of pasta and threat modeling. And I wanted to start with something that I talked about in the book. And this is basically a lot of people will say, well, how do I get started? You know, this is, seems kind of so complicated. I looked at your book and Neil referred, you know, uh, kind of jokingly talked about how, 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 how large it is. It's, it's a large book. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the idea is, is that threat modeling, you know, it, whether you're at its infancy or you've been doing it for quite some time, um, in, in different capacities, you, you, you can um, look at it in, in the th following three different tiers. Number one, let's say, so where to, first of all, um, we'll talk a lot more about where does threat modeling go, it, get injected into in terms of an SDLC or an SSDLC. But, you know, so when you're defining requirements and, defi and designing your application, you can build a blind threat model. If you've never done threat modeling before, you can do a blind threat model. And what you're doing here is you're basically correlating best practices, but not at an, like an ISO level or at an NIST level. You want to basically say, what is the best practice for different protocols that your application components are using? So you might have a baseline of like even 10 or 20 or 50 different best practices. Some of them might be architectural. Some of them might be platform. Some of them might be application specific, coding related best practices. You can take that and simply, it's called a blind threat model because your preemptive mitigation during your definition and your design time. Um, basically going over to the full right uh, of the full risk-based threat model, really this is about doing crunching on good data, looking at solid threat intel, threat data that you could harvest, cultivate, um, and, and, and basically substantiate threat claims. You want to be able to substantiate your threat model by saying, we've been looking at this type of traffic, which is indicative of injection-based attacks, or it's indicative of extortion-based attacks for our IoT devices or whatnot. This is the PASTA framework. Um, basically, it's meant to be a true methodology. Um, oftentimes, you know, you hear about what are the methodologies that are out there, and people reference Stride. Stride is a threat categorization model. It's, it's, a, it's a good categoriz threat categorization model where you can put certain types of threats in different types of buckets. Um, but PASTA is really meant to be a process for simulating attacks so that you can do threat analysis for your applications. And it has seven stages, and each stage has different activities. And we've, um, in the book, we've actually mapped those activities to uh, OpenSAM as well as BSIM um, so that if you want to kind of measure and 
crawl, walk, and run, you can do that with the different stages. But in today's presentation, we'll quickly go over different case studies of threat modeling. Some of them might be in healthcare, some of them might be in IoT. I was going to include some more, but I only have 40 minutes uh, in the talk. <clears throat> the, again, the main distinguishing qualities here is going to be, you know, that, that doesn't exist in other frameworks is the fact that you have, um, you're really taking the time to understand what is the point of this application? What is the information importance? What is the, uh, is, is, is there, and a lot of that begins with understanding the criticality of the information you're managing. Maybe you're developing an application that's highly regulated. What does the lack of regulation mean? Does it mean that you lose accreditation as a business, as a product? And if you do, that, that means dollars. So all of these things are things that like a business analyst or a product owner is thinking about, and those types of things uh, find themselves into functional requirements, and that's what we're trying to uh, advocate is consider some of the security requirements as, as things that you can bake in. The other main distinguishing quality here is the threat analysis. Again, harvesting good threat intel. How do we know, like it's funny, you know, um, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I live in a particular county. And, uh, you know, the particular county is known, you know, for to, to be, it's, it's in a city, right? Atlanta's a big city, and there's, there's some crime. So different parts of the city have different types of crime. It, typically, as, as humans and as, you know, house owners, you know, you might you want to protect your, your valuables, your, obviously your family and stuff like that. You think about what types of security controls you put on your person or your house or your car based upon the amount of threat that you feel. It's almost intuitive, right, as humans. Um, we, we seem to have lost that sometimes in, in, in doing application threat modeling because we, we should substantiate what are the threat uh, claims that we have against an application and not just simply use you know, idle lists like top tens or stuff like that um, just simply be, because it might not correlate to your deployment model. It might not correlate to your information model. It might not correlate to a lot of different things. Risk is in and of itself its own religious debate, I think, worldwide, you know, in terms of security. But, you know, what we're trying to do here is put a little bit of science to it in terms of what is really risk. And at the end of the day, we should all just care about, you know, residual risk, not the word just risk or inherent risk. But what is the residual risk that we want to live with as an application owner, as a developer? Where are we trying to get to? So at the end of of this, we're trying to basically you know, define time that developers can, can develop specific countermeasures that actually affect real substantiated threats that have a certain level of impact. So um, this particular risk formula is simply, uh, if, if you recall the, the three-tiered uh, threat modeling ways, one of the more advanced forms is actually looking uh, solving for P and looking at Probabilist, doing probabilistic analysis for which different threat claims that you're making for, against your application can, can actually happen. <clears throat> now, there's simple ways to do this. You know, um, I always talk about crawl, walk, and running when you're doing any type of a security process. Um, and, uh, and, and so basically, you know, what you want to do is you want to be able to, to substantiate a lot of your, your claims. And some of that can be very simplistic. You can do probabilistic bands. So this is where I talked about earlier before where you can actually include in application threat modeling, what are my pen testers doing? What, is, what are my dynamic uh, application analyzers doing? Um, how are they breaking the application? How is, a, how is our white hat in a multinational you know, Swiss bank or a global banking company or a government, how are our white hats breaking down the application? And so you can basically come up with probabilistic bands very simplistically or you can use, you know, more, you know, sophisticated forms of statistical analysis in order to do regression modeling and do predictive analysis on the likelihood of these types of threats on occurring. You also want to substantiate, like if I, if I were to say um, higher education, I know higher education in every, you know, country might be different, but in the United States, um, you know, higher, higher education, you know, uh, universities have a challenge. They have a challenge of running open networks for you know, uh, fostering research and collaboration and stuff like that, but at the same time, it baking in security. So it's like conflicting goals and objectives. Because there's a lot of IP that comes out of places like Carnegie Mellon and MIT and Caltech and Georgia Tech. 
And so how do you basically ensure that the right people are tapped into those labs and not the wrong people siphoning out you know, um, IP, essentially, into other places? So you, know, you look at the precedence of threats. You look at the precedence of threats to establish key threat motives, threat actors, that have happened in other, within the industry. And it doesn't have to be exhaustive, but that it starts as a good baseline. Um, just quickly going you know, through some other artifacts that are associated with pa pasta. This is a uh, kind of a, um, a reflection of some work that was done uh, for building a RACI model. And this is, seems um, kind of elaborate here. But if you work for a multinational company, it's specifically more like a, a bank or, or something like that, that is you know, more mature in security processes, <clears throat> you typically have you know, corporate functions. And then you have multiple different business units or, or product groups that are doing different things. And so, um, you know, all of them are going to have different risk appetites, uh, different roles, but typically you have managers within those BU functions, project manager, BA, an architect, software engineer, QA person, and you, you can actually create a RACI model that is specific for your organization. Um, PASTA is really meant to align with a, a secure software development lifecycle. And this particular artifact, you'll get this slide, you can, you can look at this and see at a very simplistic way, what types of inputs and outputs you could actually leverage from already within your organization. So for example, DAS reports or, or static analysis reports, where would you put that into? Well, that would come under your uh, stage five of PASTA, which is your weakness identification or vulnerability analysis. Where is my application broken? Where has it been broken before? If I'm doing threat modeling for the first time, I want to look at you know what's wrong with it and I want to ingest those types of uh, artifacts into my threat model, it doesn't mean that there's automatically a threat. And that's, that's the mistake oftentimes that a vulnerability or a weakness doesn't necessarily mean that there's substantiated threats or attacks that are imminently going to happen. You have to substantiate that. And so, but the point is, is that you have different artifacts that already exist within your security process manager, your program that can feed pasta. And this is just simply depicting that. Uh, I'm moving along quite fast because, as you see, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of slides, and I want to get to the good stuff, which is really the, the, some of the case studies, which will begin with IoT. But as we wrap up this last slide around PASTA adoption, again, I want to stress that there's, you know, there's a crawl, walk, run type of idea. You know, there's a maturity modeling that, uh, aspect that you can apply. You can take a subset of activities. You know, if you're just doing... Let's say if, if you're a developer and you want to really, you know, do, let's say you're doing some form of threat modeling, you're doing your whiteboarding and you're, you know, d defining your, your, uh, your data flow diagrams. One of the challenges for a lot of developers is that they don't know the full extent of what they're working with in terms of application components if they're just a, you know, um, they're just basically working on a certain aspect of the application. The application might be quite large, and it might be very modular. And so you might have a UX developer. You might actually have a back-end DB developer. And what oftentimes happens is you have these Chinese walls, and then no one really knows some of the obvious architectural flaws that might exist you know, as it relates to you know, privilege escalation or uh, superfluous privileges that are basically running on the back-end where there's a single actor making all calls and there wasn't like a proper create, read, update, delete exercise that was done. Simple stuff like that reveals a lot of uh, falls in the application. We're going to begin, um, and I, we're going to begin with a case study around consumer electronics. Uh, and this is particularly around a nice, acute and cuddly company called uh, Cloud Pets. Cloud Pets, uh, th th this is actually interesting because we're applying uh, pasta to a uh, an incident, which is something that I haven't talked about. So, you know, when you have a security incident within an industry, or if you have a security incident within your company, you know, what that does is that you can take IR related events and feed that back into the threat model as it substantiates threat claims and threat actors, TTPs, you know, tools, uh, technique, tactics, techniques, and procedures of the, of the threat actor. So, the, the, again, I, I want to try to stress that the pasta process is something that can be fed with multiple different uh, artifacts. But in this particular case, um, basically CloudPets is an interesting uh, uh, 
teddy bear or a series of stuffed animals that interfaces with web-based APIs and mobile applications. And so um, basically there was, a there was a massive data leak where you know, roughly around 800,000, over half a million dollar, uh, half a million PII records were stolen. And it was a stupid related you know, flaw in the design of the uh, overall application. Um, and the, really the problem was a, a factor, a human error and change control. But uh, let's start with understanding and applying PASTA a little bit to, to understanding you know, the, the, uh, the, the business goals of this, this, this actual this product. So this particular product, the CEO and the executives were advocating and saying that you know, we're trying to create new experiences for children, for teenagers. We, we want to be able to take traditional toys that you know, cute and cuddly. But we want to be able to, to 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 update content. We want to be able to integrate, you know, with uh, get other people involved too. You know, the parents involved, the you know, friends and family involved. And so there's a there's a mobile app. The mobile app provides that interaction. And there's other types of app related hooks. Um, so all this really translates to is that a mobile client um, interfacing with a series of you know web APIs uh, to the client, and then there's a series of Web APIs that interface with the actual device using Bluetooth web enabled technologies. So, but again, this particular phase is focused on what, what could go wrong inherently for this type of business model. Well, this is actually a startup and this is, um, they're, they're part of a, a company that is actually listed. The stock is doing horrible, but it's not because of this. Um, but, you know, if you look at, you know, if, if we're all part of, like, let's say the, the product team here in this room, we look at, you know, unique, some of the goals here, unique app experiences, bridging the divide between toys and physical items and different connected platforms, leveraging Bluetooth low energy technology, and continuing to monetize through the sale of complementary uh, apps and content. This is underlined there because as, you know, if you pass the part of it is trying to think like a criminal too. When I think of, when I look at this and I see news feeds like this and I've you know, imagined myself as a black hat, I want to be able to think about ways in. I want to be able to get into this product. I want to get into that cute little teddy and be able to say horrible things just because for the lulz, right? And just menace kids all over the world, uh, per se. Um, when there's content that's being fed, I already know that a lot of this type of benign content might be unauthenticated. And, and because there's a precedence for that uh, for IoT devices. But at the end of the day, you have lovely mom and dad trying to basically tell their daughter or son, you know, cute little things, send pictures. There's a lot of intimate stuff. And what actually happened was is that this information was compromised um, and was basically the individuals were, were trying to be extorted by, uh, by uh, hackers that have compromised the data. But what you want to do you know, when you're once you've defined what is the importance of the goals of the application in stage one of pasta, is you want to be able to you try to map what are some of the inherent threats. Well, in this case, uh, you want to be able to kind of map components to use cases. And I, I, we kind of started thinking along those lines when we looked at you know the last slide where it was, you know, it had you know um, use cases of content management, content distribution. And then thinking about use cases of propagating that content, and then thinking about abuse cases of doing um, uh, unvalidated content uh, um, uh, pushes to to IoT devices. What actually um, for you know beyond just trying to map the use uh, an abuse case to a use case, we want to be able to dissect the application components, and there's a lot uh, related to to. To, to this particular product because just on the teddy bear alone, you have a programmable, uh, programmable logical controller card, which you know, it could be an Arduino board, or it could be something along those lines. And there's some inherent flaws uh, that, that are associated with most IoT devices, mostly around crypto, mostly around um, authentication and uh, a valid validation for authenticated requests. But on top of that, you have a mobile client and on top of that, you have the, the web-related client, client. So in, in, in PASTA stage two, we want to be able to enumerate all technologies that we're working with. 
as part of a product. And so we want to be able to look at that web-enabled Bluetooth technology. We want to be able to look at the GATT schema, G-A-T-T, -T, that was used that basically has different provisions for how you communicate to an IoT teddy bear, um, a consumer electronic device. Um, so here up on the board, you know, you also want to be able to enumerate, you know, different actors. Is that for me? Wow. <clears throat> um, so you want to be able to enumerate different actors. Uh, basically, there's a lot of unauthenticated requests uh, in this overall architectural model. Um, this basically, this slide here was meant to say, well, how can we do some, if we were to do that blind threat model, how could we apply some of the frameworks that are out there? Maybe there's some security mitigations for uh, Bluetooth-enabled web technology that we could do or uh, crypto-related implementations for IoT devices, and there's plenty of lists for that. So there's an opportunity that in Stage 1, Stage stage 2, you actually map those particular types of recommendations into your uh, application. So uh, basically, scoping an attack surface is really what, be, what we will begin to understand with stage two of PASA because we, we begin to see what are the technologies that we are working with. And if you look at this particular slide here, you have the generic, the, uh, this particular cloud pass was actually using the generic attributes um, uh, schema. And there's a lot of functionality that's associated with the schema that is all using unauthenticated requests. So uh, the device access between the web-related uh, tiers of series of web published web APIs and the actual device is extremely powerful. And there's an, imp there's an implicit trust model that exists between the device and the web-based APIs. So a lot of the stuff, the mistakes that are being made within the CloudPets case was extremely easy, but no one really took time to do a simple data flow diagram to understand where the trust boundaries exist and what types of uh, malicious uh, activities could exist. Unauthorized requests from rogue APIs. Be, you could actually enumerate using, if you understand enough of the, the GATT schema, there are uh, calls that you can make to enumerate all devices that are associated with that, uh, that are interfacing with that web API. So that basically gives me a list of potentially all of the teddy bears that are syncing up to uh, an exposed web API. And so the purpose for that is to be able to do maybe mass propagation of rogue content as an example. So you want to be able to, as a threat modeler, to be able to think what are the different types of use cases that you could map to abuse cases. And that's what stage three is about. Once you understand what your, you've dissected your technology components for your application in different parts, you want to map the use cases and see how they communicate with one another. This, these are all the different backend um, related uh, transactions or, or uh, da database components that are, were part of a MongoDB. The MongoDB went through an update that actually exposed it architecturally to the web and allowed for more than half a million records to be compromised. So in this particular case, the actual uh, exploit was simply a misconfiguration of a backend database architecturally. So if we look at you know, things in order to uh, identify what types of abuse cases we can map to the use cases within our data flow diagram. This particular, uh, this, so we, we move on quickly to a stage four, and we have to be able to substantiate all of the different malicious actions that these actors could do against our uh, overall different parts of our model. And we have to have some level of rationale for, for this. Why would someone want to get PII for this type of consumer electronic device? Or would they just do it for the lull? So we begin to kind of brainstorm a library of different threats or threat uh, actors that we can build against our application model. And that's something that will be living as the application evolves time and time again. This ultimately was uh, the, the final count of, of uh, data that was compromised was roughly around 800,000 um, 800, records. And again, it was compromised directly th through a poor uh, architectural flaw within the overall um, cloud pets architecture. The scenario of threat analysis should allow us to look at application components embedded third-party libraries, um, 
our overall deployment model, our trust boundaries and how we're using authentication, um, how we're maybe using elevated act, uh, privileges for different application actors that are making calls across our application model so that we can define, you know, map uh, areas within our application data flow diagram that actually could be susceptible to some of the threats that we're making in stage four. Now, I mentioned before Stride. What we did for as part of a project, we worked with a, a, fed, a large federal agency in the United States, and you know we we saw a need to kind of build, uh, you know, go beyond Stride and maybe kind of uh, extend it a little bit. And one of the things that we saw was that extortion really wasn't well captured in Stride, and that's a common you know threat that's happening today with ransomware and other types of extortion-based attacks. So we basically you know took us a Stride Plus Two approach and to kind of, kind of create or get the, the brainstorming go, going with a broader uh, threat modeling community to see if we can basically create our first threat library, which I hope that we can do this summer in June with part of the OWASP Summit. But what you want to do with Stage 4 is to build your own threat library for your own applications, whether it be a healthcare application or a mobile application for a casino gambling or, or sports betting or whatever. Uh, you want to be able to, to look at and, and define what are some of the inherent threats that your application uh, could, could be aligned with. Now, for, for cloud, uh, cloud pets, the, the issue really came down to lack of CRUD exercises in, in uh, their overall application model. So they didn't do look at how the, their application components and see, oh, I have uh, actual uh, components on my actual device that are... Uh, receiving content or updates from mobile uh, from the web APIs without any level of authentication. They didn't actually see architecturally that their MongoDB was exposed from an administrative use case of adminning the MongoDB uh, backend database. So the, the vulnerability analysis that takes place in stage five of PASTA looks to uh, look at all the different activities that we can de see in terms of what's wrong with our application at the source code level, in terms of the implementation model, in terms of the design model. And then we can actually build something what's called an attack tree. So we build attack trees in stage six in order to exercise the viability of exploits. You know, if, if this were done, uh, if the weaknesses were identified, and if the abuse cases were tested out, then as a company, the cloud pets could have easily found multiple different insecure, implicit trust scenarios that were associated with the, with the application and the, uh, the architectural flaw that they had. At the end, we're trying to get to a residual risk analysis. So the, the prior steps of trying to uh, enumerate technology associated with flaws, uh, test out those flaws with uh, different exploit exploitative techniques comes down to what requires remediation the most? Um, there's a whole movement called I Am the Calorie, and I was looking at one of Josh Corman's talks where he talked about making an analogy to sharks and how we're failing as an industry. And I, and I kind of disagree in the sense that, um, that uh, we're failing simply because for when I look at different organizations, they're simply not implement, they're not executing correctly. You know, the, m most uh, organizations are not executing and doing the proper implementation and security testing. They're, they're doing checkbox security. They're doing compliance-based security. They're doing, uh, letting the tools define what security is for them. And we're missing the residual risk analysis that really takes a step back and tries to understand what are the likely at at attack patterns that are going to affect my uh, application model. I know I have five minutes left, and I have a mobile application use case study. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and dive in, but this, this really relates to healthcare. We work a lot with healthcare providers. In this particular one, um, we looked at a mobile application that was meant for physicians that have their own practice, and they want to be able to do, you know, meet with a, a patient and interface with them and get all of their PHI information you know, on a tablet and whatnot. They also want to be able to, this is trying to map you know, some of the goals for this particular app. They want to be able to integrate clinical drug trial referral opportunities via the mobile app. So you know, a lot of things are at stake for the physician if the application is 
not uh, having high integrity uh, uh, data. And, and, and can you imagine a physician making the wrong recommendations for clinical drug trials to a, to, to, to a patient's condition? I mean, that, that's, that, that in, the, in the physician's adoption of this type of mobile application, I mean, that's a deal breaker, right? So uh, we again going back to um, you know a pasta based approach. We want to be able to begin with understanding what is the goal of the application and the application components and use cases. Um, it's actually you know so moving on to stage two again, re reiterating you know uh, the different uh, steps of pasta for this particular application for mobile applications. It's really easy to to look at. To to, um, to look at the, uh, for example, if you're doing Android development, look at the application manifests, uh, the activities that are denoted in the uh, manifest files to, to basically understand, okay, these are the uh, different types of activities supported by my client side mobile application. What are the underlying technologies, calls, data flows, or even actors that are associated with these activities? And these are the types of questions that you know, we, we want to, to ask. Um, Ultimately, you know, our, our uh, mobile-based technology, uh, our stage two of PASTA might actually extend to understanding also this, the server side, the web service side of, um, of our mobile application. So understanding how are we doing, are we doing JSON-based, you know, requests, are we using, you know, XML SOAP-based exchanges between, you know, our, our, our web service applications and whatnot. Um, a lot of this, this type of activities is actually easy to identify uh, but we, it simply traditionally hasn't been done in, in, in traditional threat modeling. Um, how am I doing on time? I'm on three minutes, okay. So I, I want to focus on um, attack sur you know, understanding your attack surface really comes from stage two. What, what are the technology components that you're working with? Do you know how to do enum exercises so that you're dissecting your application into open source third-party libraries that are being used? Uh, you want to be able to, to break it down as much as you can. And uh, a lot of different tools that are out there, like um, My App Security has a tool, and then there's SD Elements has a tool, there's uh, Arius Risk has a tool. What's missing in all the tools is, is simply a, an asset listing, right? I mean, a vast asset listing. So you want to be able to, it would be great if something could fingerprint your application and say, these are all the components that you didn't know that you were working with. And they're associated with different use cases that are being menaced by these types of threats. But that's really the end goal that we're doing from a manual standpoint. Um, <clears throat> stage three really becomes into trying to understand the use cases and mapping to these different components. How are we using near field technologies in mobile applications or SMS or what about um, voice dictation for medical? You know, or are you doing transcription? You want to be able to say, where is that data being temporarily stored? Is there caching systems that are capturing this PHI data that I'm not considering for protection? I know we're um, running closely out of time, so I'm, I'm moving quickly here. This, this particular, you know, let's talk about data flow diagramming for a second here. Once You can't really do effective data flow diagramming unless you've done a good stage two. So stage four, stage three, when you're doing uh, application decomposition and doing data flow diagramming, really hinges on how well have you dissected your application to different components. And then it also hinges on how do you understand how those components support different use cases. <clears throat> the threat analysis, especially for healthcare, you, it's, it's kind of unique because now you're having to look at inherent threats for mobile applications, but specific to healthcare, right? So you look at some of the traditional mobile-related uh, weaknesses that exist, like client-side storage. Well, look at some of the, the, the threats around mobile. One of the most rising prevalent threats out there is the rise of mobile exploit kits. And you know, that's just skyrocketing up. And so you want to look at the likelihood for propagation. How are you sandboxing your applications? Do you have an underlying platform um, with Android and iOS and Windows in order that explicit trust models exist, not just within your application components, but on a broader spectrum to all the other components that are supported by the architecture. So the landscape of, of, of being able to integrate threats is extremely large, and being able to, to kind of cherry pick good threat intel really should begin at home. And by, by home, I mean you're within your company. No one knows the threats to your organization, to your application, to your information better than you. 
So don't let a consultant come in or a product come in and tell you otherwise. What they're going to be able to tell you that that's something that's a little bit more valuable is what they're seeing from, from the rest of the world. Harvesting good threat intel is, is going to be a challenge because you have to make it actionable into a threat model. And the best way to do that is to get at the micro level, not at the macro level where you're looking at you know, generic based threats, but more threat specific to technologies that you're using today, like to, the, you know, to, to a micro JVM that you might have in an IoT device or whatnot. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up it just out of respect for time. Um, uh, I'm I, I more than happy. All, what I want to do here is really I try to cover two specific case studies, one in uh, healthcare, mobile, and then other in uh, IoT. But the topic is broad. And at the end of the day, you know, what, we, what you want to be able to walk away with uh, from PASTA is understanding the three main differentiators. Substantiate your threat model with credible threat sources, number one. Number two, if you're more advanced, try to see if you can data mine attacks that your white hats are doing so that you can do probabilistic analysis for the likelihood of certain attacks actually being successful against your application. Number three is to understand the business impact of what your application is doing, the information that it's managing, and also the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, component, the application components. Those application components need to be mapped to use cases so that you can say, this use case is of particular interest. Out of the box, authentication is you know, a paramount use case, um, unless the information is something that you don't care about and then uh, in, the, in the broader spectrum wouldn't be damaging for the organization. But at this time, I'd like to take any sort of questions on what I've covered. I'd be more than happy to entertain any sort of uh, private questions on the side too. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I am really interested about case studies. In your book, do you have any uh, the more examples and that we can refer and have examples to do with PASTA and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's several case studies. There's actually some that relates to um, dealing with fraud for uh, banking and finance. Uh, so there's, you know, how do, how do you basically... Um, leverage forensic analysis and incidents that have actually happened and it was specific to the banking industry uh, and, and, and defeating PASTA as a threat model. The other uh, case studies that are more prevalent is in applying PASTA when you're simply developing an application. So it's, it's really meant to uh, cater more to the developer audience in terms of how they can basically integrate activities of PASTA when doing uh, different types of primarily agile based development. Um, Agile is fast and iterative, and the challenge is compartmentalizing a lot of the threat modeling activities so that it also becomes iterative within your you know, software development lifecycle. But yeah, there's, there, there's a lot of different case studies uh, within the book that are referenced. I, I don't have copies of the book here with me now. You mentioned about uh, white hat hackers. Mm -hmm. Why can't you use a black hat hackers information Even like Even better, a yeah. I mean, app I sensor or you know, OWASP app <laughs> sensor and they use some monitoring activities and find the weaknesses and feed yeah. back into the Absolutely, system. yeah. No, I mean, I was just trying to be nice. I mean, uh, if, I, I, screw the, the white hats, to be honest. I mean, the black hats are really the way to go. Uh, you, you want, and that's, that's you know, running a firm, it's you, hiring people that have 15 years of, of hacking, hacking experience um, doesn't mean anything if they don't think like a criminal. You have to think like a criminal. And at the end of the day, if you want to be good at security, and that's, that's one of the challenges with developers is that they have a functional mindset. I used to be a developer, and you're, you're building and you're thinking constructively, but a, a, a criminal or a hacker is thinking more destructively. And so absolutely, I mean, you know, if, if you have... Um, if, if you have the fortune to, to, to truly have black hats within your arsenal and team, then absolutely that's the way to go. Um, how do you make sure that your threads that you're listing are exhaustive? Because I think that's one of the biggest challenges when, when doing threat modeling. Uh, how do you make sure that what? That you list all the relevant threats because that's... Right, yes. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely a challenge. Um, 
I, I think it's definitely a challenge, but I think it's less of a challenge. I think the biggest challenge with, with is listing all of the components that could be threatened. Uh, I think that that's a bigger challenge because, you know, especially if you're the threat modeler that's facilitating a threat modeling exercise, you're, you're relying on your developers, your engineers to tell you what they know, but they might not know the full extent of what they're working with. But to answer your question, um, that really uh, hinges on a, a good security professional to be cognizant of that, that mapping two things. Number one, threats to the data, and then uh, th threats to the components, the application components that you're working with. I think that if you take separate exercises to enumerate those, you'll come up with a, a pretty comprehensive threat library, and it shouldn't be very vast because you want to map your threat library to attack patterns. You know, threats are idle unless they're supported by an attack. So, um, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. Appreciate it.